This video is a set of reflections in response to Philip DeFranco, and it's being done with complete respect and appreciation for Philip DeFranco. Because let me tell you something. I try to read news and political analysis on Asia from every reputable and respectable source. The Economist, Foreign Policy Magazine, London School of Economics, the most elite academic institutions and the most elite and distinguished news and journalism institutions. And Philip DeFranco, right now, you do a better job than any of them and all of them. When you deign to, like, one day a month, take a break from covering internet drama and YouTube gossip to talk about politics of Asia. So Philip DeFranco does, in general, do a very good job. However, um, I could do better <laughs> if I had the time to dedicate it to it. And we hope we're just now packing up and relocating to Taiwan. I hope I will have the time to dedicate to it. In this video, I'm in many ways bringing together observations from, like, 25 years of research. It's not what I want to do, though. What I really want to do is challenge myself by doing original research, new research, learning things I didn't already know. Let me tell you something. Philip DeFranco, early on in his new video about China's hegemony over the oceans, their control of oceanic trade and various disputed islands and territories, he mentions pretty briefly that that part of the world is maybe responsible for like 21% of the world's trade. He, he throws out some economic statistics really quickly that makes it seem like these obscure islands located in this strange tongue-shaped formation extending out southeast from China. They're of this extraordinary economic value. Why? In 2019, why? The answer goes all the way back to the Dark Ages. All right? A scholar named Henri Pirenne wrote a famous, famous monograph that started the question about how international trade shapes the course of civilizations, cultural development, politics, all the other meaningful things we care about. And he started it in a book that ended up being titled in English, Mohammed and Charlemagne. That book came out at a really interesting time and it played a really interesting role in this. And yes, Believe me, this is not a digression. This has everything to do with Europe's current relationship to China. I kid you not. I'm getting back there. Right? He started questioning for the first time, why was there such a decline in the material quality of civilization from the Roman Empire period to what we call the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, etc.? Now, there's a weird kind of parallel here. Again, in Philip DeFranco's video, there's this discourse about China's century of decline, the idea that the Qing dynasty, maybe even longer, starting before the Qing dynasty, that China became decadent, um, degenerate, self-indulgent, weaker and weaker, etc., and then had to uh, take back its rightful place in the world. Well, actually, Europe has a very similar discourse it just several centuries earlier, right? That there was this period of greatness that hit its pinnacle, maybe under Julius Caesar in the Roman Empire, maybe somebody picks another Emperor Justinian, your favorite emperor from the Roman Empire. And then, for some reason, everything gets worse. So Melissa and I, Melissa's my girlfriend sitting off camera, we were in a museum uh, in the middle of nowhere in Germany, Heidelberg, right? <laughs> Not even Heidelberg, the... Speyer, so uh, the countryside outside of Heidelberg, Germany, and they had been part of the Roman Empire, and they had trade goods from North Africa. So they had perishable trade goods. They had stuff like wine in an earthenware jug being traded from North Africa all the way to basically Heidelberg, Germany. Okay, So the extent of international trade in the Roman Empire now seems spectacular. And it didn't just go in that direction. It went all the way from Rome to Thailand. I kid you not, I've seen it with my own eyes. In the National Museum in Bangkok, you can see a Roman lamp. You saw some now in Germany, too. So they went all the way from Rome up to Germany. Well, they also went all the way east to Bangkok. Now, they could not send perishable goods to Bangkok. They could not bake fresh brownies and then sell them in Bangkok. They couldn't export cheese or something like that that would go bad for those huge... But yes, yeah, something like a metal lamp, those kinds of trade goods really did go all around the world. And as is well known, um, specifically the coin that has the name of Julius Caesar on it, I believe is the single most attested 
um, artifact in the history of the world. They're found everywhere. It's troublesome to people. They're even found here in North America. Every so often one turns up in Canada, the United States. So coinage, durable metal objects spread everywhere. In this scholarly work, Henri Piren, for the first time, really started to question, why did this decline happen? And he challenged the tendency we all have, and that again, the Chinese also have, to just look at this in terms of decadence as some kind of moral and aesthetic decay. So remember, like in terms of art history, you're shown a picture of this statue from Athens, and you go, wow, that's an unbelievably realistic, well-proportioned, muscular statue from ancient Athens. And then you see this statue from ancient Rome. And then you go look at the Dark Ages. And it seems like all of a sudden nobody knows how to draw an accurate picture of a human being, right? Like Jesus looks like a miniature adult, not like a baby. And nobody's muscular anymore. And like nobody's proportioned. And they don't have, you know, the people in the background, they don't have realistic perspective, right? So it's very easy to prevent, present to, to students, present in the classroom, just this narrative of decline. Well, what, what does decline mean? What does it mean? So what Henri Piran was pointing out is that the decline is in large part due to these networks that produce value. So ultimately economic, but includes things like education. Like when you have a trade in complex wares like glass and metal and wine and all kinds of other things over a huge area, you have uh, books, manuscripts, I mean, this time they're mostly handmade manuscripts, there's some primitive uh, printing around, but you know, being written and copied and passed around, you have a network of education, a network of economic interactions that under the Roman Empire spread way, way, way beyond the Roman Empire. And that really what we perceive as a cultural dec decline and a cultural collapse is in fact an economic collapse. Now the actual book I have read. I have read Henri Piren's Mohammed and Charlemagne. And most people who quote the book and give lectures about it have not. It is a very poorly organized, very scattered book, and he died before it was published. So it's one of those cases where other people had to take the pieces and put them together, as I recall. Um, but it became a symbol for this new movement towards economic history, put it that way. So there has never been a land barrier between Europe and China, right? this general analysis of world history. Why are all these boats, even today, why are they going through these obscure islands in the middle of nowhere of Southeast Asia? Why didn't we have continuous trade and development building up roads and railways linking Paris to Beijing the same way that we have between Paris and Berlin? Why don't we have the kind of overland trade that Europe completely takes for granted extending between Europe and China? Why has that never happened? Again, I'm not saying it would happen overnight. I'm saying over the last 1,000 years, there is no reason, there is no, sorry, there is no self-evident obvious reason, I'm about to tell you the reason, why trade had to go between Europe and Asia by going west out of the Mediterranean, then they would stop at Portugal. And this is why Portugal became a great empire. Portugal had no other advantages. Portugal, the population was puny at that time. They didn't have some kind of amazing technology. You have to go from Portugal all the way around Africa, all the way around India, right? And then to, to East Asia. So this is before the canal was built in uh, what's now Egypt, Suez Canal, etc., etc., right? This unbelievably circuitous and indirect route. It was so indirect, it was so difficult to trade silk between China and Europe that a guy you may have heard of named Christopher Columbus managed to make a proposal to the King of Spain that he was going to find a new, more direct trade route by going straight west from Spain. It didn't work out. And by the way, when he did that, it was based on the maps by Strabo. Strabo of Alexandria ancient Greek maps. During the Dark Ages in Europe, there was so little progress in learning and academia and research. They were still using geography that ultimately is from like Herodotus in ancient Athens. Unbelievable. But an updated just a little bit after Herodotus. But the level of ignorance is truly unbelievable. We, have, we still have the maps in Strabo that were used to make this proposal to the, the King of Spain. Okay, well, 
here's the thing. Even the title, Muhammad and Charlemagne, what it's getting at is a very pleasant, very economically objective sounding reevaluation of what we can frankly call Islamophobia, right? What does it boil down to? Why did quality of life in Western Europe, not even, not just Western Europe, Western Europe and the whole Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Europe, really two areas, right? The Northwest and the Mediterranean. Why did quality of life decline so dramatically? And in one, an one word, the answer is Islam. Islam changed everything. The discovery that Henri Piran made is, hey, everyone's ignoring how important Islam is to the history of Europe. And in a sense, it's obvious. They conquered Spain. But implicitly, those people in Germany, who had been part of the Roman Empire before, they couldn't get wine or uh, oil or other goods from North Africa anymore. The trade in glass and soap uh, from Aleppo in Syria, the economic geography of Europe was profoundly changed by the Islamic empires, plural, right? And of course, there were more salacious elements. If we talk about the slave trade, oh, suddenly everybody's interested. Everyone's more interested in slavery than the history of wine and oil, um, glass, and these other things. But this is this dramatic, deep impact on the social geography of Europe. And here is the necessary sequel that still to this day, nobody wants to deal with. Everyone knows this, but it's easy to forget this. Islam is not one religion. The most profound effect on the social and economic geography of both China and Europe is the split between Sunni and Shiite that still exists to this day. This is a real historical fact. It was the split between Sunni and Shiite not the fall of the Roman Empire, not the fall of any particular dynasty in China, not the building of the Great Wall. One thing ended overland trade between China and Europe. And that was the basically constant state of war, constant state of hostility between Sunni Islam and Shiite Islam. That is what severed forever the most fundamental economic fact that had been taken for granted under Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, and that indirectly had fueled Central Asia, North India, Europe, and extended its tendrils all the way into China for durable goods, things like silk and metal, things that could really go a long, long way. Even tea, by the way. Different story. History of the tea trade. Well, that's right, sir. There was, there was the Silk Road, and then parallel to it was what was called the, uh, the Tea Horse Road. Uh, sounds better in Chinese. But yeah, tea was one of these trade goods that could go a long, long way, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, the end of the Silk Road, it, it still continues to this day. Do you want to build a high-speed rail network that connects China to Europe? You got to go through Iran and Iraq, right? And the generalized state of low-level chaos and hostility. Today, we do have the Suez Canal. Boats don't have to go all the way around Africa. But it's an unbelievably indirect and circuitous route to still go all the way around India. Well, by the way, guess where you get to stop on our new super efficient trade route to China? Where do you get to moor your boat? Yemen. Peaceful, ready for business, open for world trade, Yemen. The happy harbor of Aden in the country of Yemen, where there's a, sorry, this is 2019. There's a major civil war still ongoing in Yemen, and Yemen does still matter for world trade for that reason. So you got to go past Yemen, you got to go around India, and you got to go through these waters that, guess what? China wants politically to control. But that's why those waters are so important. Now, you may say, when I've talked about this with professors and with PhDs and stuff, I've never once had anyone even ask this question. It's an intelligent question. When I discuss it with people, they normally sit there absolutely shocked and say, I can't believe any of the textbooks I was taught. I can't believe any of the seminar discussions I had at Cambridge or Oxford or London School of Economics or wherever it was, SOAS or wherever it was they studied. I can't believe we never dealt with this, even when they did quote unquote economic history. It's so, and like normally I'm talking to people and they know enough that, like, you know, this is just a missing puzzle piece. They know all this other stuff in economic history, and they're like, oh my God, you're right. That's this huge piece of the puzzle, right? It would be intelligent to say back, 
well, yeah, you know, the Silk Road was super important until, uh, you know, this constant state of war, until Islam transformed the social geography of the world, and specifically the Sunni-Shiite split. But, you know, you look at the map. It's not the only road. Couldn't people have compensated by building trains through Mongolia? Couldn't they have compensated by building trains through Russia? Or, on the southernmost cusp, the train they are building right now, a train that will finally connect India to China, through the easternmost little span of India, going through Myanmar, then going through good old Dehong, Yunnan, China, through Yunnan into China. That is finally being built now, in 2019. Yes, historically, fantasies have existed of either replacing the Silk Road, or at an earlier time, competing with the Silk Road by building major trade routes either further north or further south through the enormous landmass of, of Eurasia. There is space. It was not impossible. But the more you know, the more you realize why it was just barely possible. Okay? Like, have you tried walking through the mountains of northern Myanmar into Yunnan? Have you tried walking? Have you tried using a mule? Have you tried building a train? Really tough. And, okay, sorry, until the day before yesterday, well, there still is civil war in those mountains. I was going to say there's been civil war until they Actually, there still are armed insertion groups there fighting civil wars. Plenty of them. Um, including, uh, anyway, including right where we were. Um, you know, just, just across from, just across the border from, from uh, the Hong. Anyway, so, you know, uh, actually, still today in 2019, there are armed groups fighting wars there. But 100 years ago, even more so. These were really, really chaotic areas. So, I mean, that, that's just the southern route through Yunnan. When you talk about the northern route, okay, you're going to have to look into stuff like the Khitan Empire. If you go through century by century, when was there an opportunity to build and sustain some kind of route like that? Yeah, it, it, historically, there's a parallel universe where that was not completely impossible, but there are reasons why it, it really didn't work out. And then ultimately, the fantasy of really making it work, the French Empire wanted to build that train. They wanted to build a train going from Vietnam to India. Uh, the Russian Empire wanted to build a train. They did build a train, a very, very thin, rickety strip of track connecting their empire on the Pacific to, to Western Russia and, and ultimately to, to Eastern Europe. Um, there were attempts, but so far, I mean, those have been the kind of rickety, feeble attempts to compensate for a thousand years in which that world trade system has been broken down and cut off. So that is the background to the bizarre and fascinating history that Philip DeFranco has just reminded us of, that we're still in a situation where these islands that seem so meaningless in and of themselves remain pawns. In a, in a chess game that spans the whole wide world and that seems to, you know, determine who's going to control world trade to an unbelievable extent. And, yeah, guess what? There are many roads to peace, but sometimes the road to peace is literally building a new road. <laughs>